Hi, this is Kirk Davis. Hi, hey, I'm here with Ben Marsh from Scout Systems. It's been a pleasure and honor, Ben, to get to know you over, oh, over the last year, year and a half or so. It's been a short time, but wow. Um, you've spoken at camps events. Uh, you and I have done a podcast together where I got to know a little bit more about you. And of course, I see you on LinkedIn all the time, which I think is very smart, a very smart strategy that, that you're doing. But I just wanted to introduce Ben. As, uh, he's going to be a panel speaker at an upcoming camps event. And we'll record that and you, and you should be able to have that available. Uh, the topic is really uh, assisting uh, workers, you know, with technology industry 4.0 and machine learning and Internet of Things. And Ben is a master. He's uh, achieved mastery Jedi status here. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's because you're an innovator, Ben. Tell, tell us more about you and, and what you've got going. Yeah, I mean, my, I spent my career. Uh, I went to school as a, a manufacturer. I'm sorry, mechanical engineer. And then as soon as I graduated, I found manufacturing, fell in love with it, pursued Six Sigma, got my black belt in that. Uh, and then all of the forms of automation that I did, every project that I would ever do, it all circled back around of the baseline of data. And if you didn't have an understanding of it, there was no way of knowing were you improving or, or, or sacrificing some of the gains that you had since you put in this change. And throughout my career, as I was building all these projects and working with this one, the thing that I kept finding was that the, the skilled worker and the tribal knowledge that they had was something that people always talked about, like it was something that was very important, but it was never given the respect and the, the treatment that I felt like it deserved. So what I wanted to do was how do we build a platform that before these people retire and move on, because the average age of that skilled labor force keeps going up. Yeah. And I was figuring, how do we download that in a way to position the next generation to maintain that level of quality? Because you can't put a robot in to replace some of these people. It's just not, we're not ready for that. And no. we got to figure out a way that we can bridge the gap between those generations, as well as how do we take in a younger workforce that has so many opportunities and excite them to enter manufacturing. And that was, that was our goal within uh, Scout Systems. Well, well, Ben, but you're making a great point though, and that's that the new people coming in, you know, the tribal knowledge is with the experienced workers who are retiring. Yep. And, and a lot of times that, that knowledge doesn't transfer. So okay. you almost have a situation on the shop floor where people are starting over from scratch all the time. Yeah, there's that or the companies that are approaching lean more and more. And then they have so many different pro uh, products. Uh, we have customers that have over a thousand different SKUs that they have for their mm -hmm. customers. And so you might only build a product once every six months, if maybe even less. And so when you have that, that refresher, I've traveled and visited plants where the operators pull out their cell phones and skip through pictures just to remember how they set up their equipment. And it's like that kind of content where the company doesn't realize that their operators are having to document their own tribal knowledge to remind themselves. And if that person left or if their cell phone broke, that tribal <laughs> knowledge is gone. Yeah. And the company doesn't even realize that that is something that's an asset to them that is floating around very in an unsecure fashion. Oh, boy. Big time. Yeah. Yep. Well, and, you know, turnover happens. And so that tribal knowledge doesn't leave just because people are retiring. Correct. Yeah. Turnover for any number of reasons could bring that tribal knowledge to another company. Absolutely. Or the Peter principle where you start to promote your best operators, they move them into different positions. And yeah. now all of a sudden your, your quality of the pool of the remainders don't necessarily have the same potency of that tribal knowledge. So what's interesting to me is you actually have designed and innovated a solution to this, which is fascinating to me. So go ahead and tell us about Scout yeah. Systems and wow, what you do. So Scout Systems does a lot, uh, but on this specific topic, what we try to do is like, so behind me on this side uh, mm -hmm. is what we call Compass. And Compass, we named it Compass because it does what a compass does. It's the guiding light to the operators. They, they use it to figure out what they do from seeing what their schedule is uh, to being able to access help and request uh, uh, assistance. But most importantly, it is a work instruction platform. So you could start without instructions and then eventually grow into using them but to take that tribal knowledge and then to document it in a way that it, it functions like a video game where operators don't have to look at an exploded bill of materials and figure out how do I put these components together. It is a picture by picture, uh, sequential process. And step by step. Exactly. And what's really nice about going digital with work instructions is when you have paper hanging out in front of the operators, one, you don't know if they're looking at it. Um, two, you don't know if they can read it because they might speak a different language. Oh, and then yeah. Three, it's not doing anything for you. It's not collecting information. It's not validating. It's not doing any of that. When you go digital, 
all the above can be done and it and it happens seamlessly behind the scenes where you don't have to have a bunch of effort so ben i gotta i gotta ask you this because when i talk to manufacturers and they talk about work instructions it's a hot topic yep ha happens all the time and they need work instructions but it's painful i mean putting together work instructions has traditionally been a very painful process yep yeah yeah that it, we've made it easier um one of the things that i like to do is uh first of all do not have your quality and your engineers design work instructions ah. i've seen i've seen them de develop these things and they're focused on uh very critical components which i will agree are important but it doesn't necessarily show the skill that has to build it it is don't do this wrong don't do this wrong but it doesn't necessarily say for the optimum performance do it in this sequence and so what i like to do and i recommend is give your operators that are skilled access to what we call our designer. We have multiple roles, so you can limit access. And then instead, grant your engineers and your quality team the approval role. So you can have um, your operators document their own work instructions. They will not become published until the people that are set as that approving role can verify that all the quality and engineering specifications are correct. So that way you can mix the skill set of both people the tribal knowledge about the process and then the quality and the engineer for making sure that your customer compliance is intact. And then you can go way faster and you have actually a product that is useful on the floor. Well, you know, you know, cause kind of what you're talking about is a sequence of, of, of production a little yep. bit too. I mean, so your operators are the ones who, who know that sequence, who do that sequence. Uh, you, you told me a story earlier about how, um, uh, was it fractal math? I'm saying the, the wrong word here. Oh, the n factorial. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can okay. you tell that story real quick? Because I again, I think it, it it's it's getting people into the digital world is going to help them. Uh, yeah. So why this this story is so important is uh, it's a segue into artificial intelligence and uh, lean major major shift in manufacturing automation major shift in manufacturing and we we look at IoT which I think we should but something that we we seem to not give as much credit to is artificial intelligence and i am very much a believer that artificial intelligence is going to have a bigger effect on manufacturing than probably all of the previous ones combined it, it's going to be epic and uh to do an example of this like over a decade ago i was working with some production supervisors and what i did is i created like a list of a couple of fake production jobs where I said that the product has to go through a press break to be bent before it can go to a spot welder to be welded. So you can't do the spot weld first, it has to be bent. And then based off of this, I used arbitrary data saying that like this job would take two hours on the press breaks, but only an hour 45 on the spot weld. And if that takes place, you'd have a 15 minute gap because they're not totally balanced. So then as I added more and more jobs, that imbalance started to stack, which happens every day in the factories. So I'm waiting for my next job or I'm intentionally slowing down because I don't have a job or I have piles uh, piling up. So what I asked the supervisors to do was I gave them this list of like eight jobs and I asked them to reorder them in a way that they thought would have the least amount of waste. And some of them spent the entire day just chipping away at that. They did the regular work, of course. But what I did is I wrote a program that ran every single combination. So it was a script that processed every one and it kicked out the output of the fastest sequence. And so the end factorial goes through and it does every single version of it. And my version was over 10% faster than the fastest supervisor's route. And the point that I was showing them was that with zero investment of tools, zero investment in staff, we just rebalance the way that you want to flow your product out and you can get a 10% capacity increase. And this is with bad data. Like this is crude cycle times that I was using. Yeah. When, when we talk about the data collection from like a work construction platform that is streaming everything, you combine that kind of accuracy with your data to an artificial intelligence platform that can go through and take a look at where you're flowing the material should go, you're going to see, I would guess, 20 plus percent increase. And that would be plant wide. This is not one robot that's going to do it two times faster than one employee. This is every single employee is functioning at a significant improvement. And then it's cheap. You and I talked about this idea of isolated improve, efficiency improvements where, you know, on a, on a shop floor, they improve this process by this much, but that's not the same as improving the overall efficiency yeah. of the shop floor, the throughput. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I feel like uh, in my career, manufacturers are really good at looking at the production floor and they go, how do we make this faster? But they never seem to look back at the office and logistics and figure out like, can we do anything over here? 
to improve this. But yeah. it seems to be everybody on this side is constantly adding more and more process changes on this one, but they don't fix some of these issues. And what's crazy about these issues is that these impact the entire shop, whereas like these isolated events are only going to improve maybe a bottleneck, which could be totally appropriate because if your bottleneck is the thing that's slowing down everything in a gross fashion, then yeah, absolutely. An isolated event makes sense. Yeah. But if you're trying to stay competitive in the market or if you're trying to uh, combat a customer's requirement of lowering your labor costs, a plant-wide improvement is necessary. It's vital. Well, you know, some, some of the stories uh, th that you've shared in the past have really highlighted to me the, that um, management, you know, production managers and maybe executive level of a company, they're sometimes they're blind to, you know, why things are the way they are. And it seems like your, yeah. your solution actually uh, illuminates or makes obvious sometimes why, why we're having production issues that, that wouldn't necessarily be obvious. It's very true. Uh, we, so our system, um, are you familiar with OEE, the overall equipment effectiveness? No, I'm not, no. Okay, so OEE is a fantastic calculation where you take uh, the percentage of, let's say your quality. So if you have 100% great parts and it's 100%, availability is a 24 hour window minus your scheduled or known breaks. And then the question is, is of that available time, how much were you producing good parts? And then the final category is your performance. How fast were you working compared to what your ideal speed oh, okay. is? So our system, it calculates all of that and it, it does it dynamically. So it, it estimates out how fast should you be working based off your performances and it will live time calculate what your true OEE is. And historically OEE has been used for equipment. But yeah. we find that it is equally as effective when you study assembly processes as well, because if you use a platform like this, you are getting the data coming in in live time, so you could process it with the same map. But I've talked with companies where prior to using our system, they thought that, well, OEE should be above 70%. So therefore, our OEE must be above 70%. But the reality was their OEE was more like 40%. Oh, wow. And, and what that means is that they are ultimately only getting 40% of the capacity out of their plant due to the lack of availability, due to quality issues, or due to the performance issues. And when companies assume that they have a 70 plus percent OEE, then they're not going to put the capital investment into their plant. And so once you realize that it's bad, it's, it's not that you are failing, it's just that you have an enormous opportunity. It's yep. much easier going from 40 to 70% than it is to go from 70 to 80 and 80 to 85. The higher yep. up you get, the harder and more expensive it is. So when you're honest with yourself and you realize that your performance is poor, you need to invest just a little bit and you will see an enormous gains. Well, you know, um, I come from the world of banking and, and business advising where if we could get business leaders to actually look at their financials and talk about their numbers, their numbers don't lie. I mean, they're you know, they're always a little suspect, right? So you're suspect of the numbers, but it made such a big difference when in their head, everything's going amazing, but on paper, it's not going so amazing. But that's what I'm hearing you say is that this is really going to give you honest, I mean, honest, real time, factual. I mean, uh, you're going to have to be pretty humble, I think. You do. And like the, the customers of ours that are excelling are the ones that have accepted that. And they go into it, not with an expectation, or it is more of a, we need to find out what's going on. And when they discover what's wrong and they start investing in it, not only do they see the gains from a financial perspective, but the operator's morale start to go up because uh, these operators know they have these problems. They, they know that this paperwork is a waste of time. They know that these, this standard check procedure is kind of just complete waste. And so once the company starts to see how grandiose they spend this money on these, these issues, then they could start to review is, is it worth it? Like, do we need to spend $10,000 a month in labor for this simple piece of paper? Like, what is this paper actually doing for our quality? Uh -huh. Has it had any impact? Maybe we should see if we can automate it or change this procedure. You do that, your operators start to get excited because they've been freed up of a task. Those kinds of things where companies need to go into these projects with an open mind, and yeah. review it. Something that worked years ago, worked years ago, but it doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean it still works today. Well, so I was impressed when, when I first met you and we talked about what you do, but you said you designed this to be a lot like a video game, which mm -hmm. I thought was very, very fascinating because it seems like you've, you've programmed some psychology into what you're doing. Yeah, we, uh, uh, 
we spent a lot of time developing the designs and we hired a very talented UX designer that went through the procedure. And that was kind of a fun experience for me. I knew uh, the, the background of manufacturing, that's all I can contribute. So I don't get credit for the design. But what I was able to contribute was explaining that not all manufacturers have a home PC. So we got to keep in mind that whatever we put in front of them, we don't want them to feel like it's a learning thing at all. And so the design we wanted to do was model more for the next generation. Everybody has cell phones and everybody's yeah. starting to play some form of a game or some form of system. And we wanted to use that as a training element rather than design against this and go more traditional. How about we progressively look towards the future and we start to design around what are people comfortable about? And within our application, um, I mean, we're, we're all over the world and I only currently speak two languages. And I could even do training in different languages by using translators and typing uh, out the messages. And the system is so intuitive that people go, oh, this is easy. And they start using it. And it's, it's wonderful. You got to love that when it's easy. And I think uh, now this is a, an odd example, but my wife really resisted getting a smartphone many years ago. Okay. I said to her, this will make your life easier. And when she finally got the, the smartphone, she, her, one of her first things she said to me goes, this has made my life easier. Oh, yeah. But that's why I think about your technology. I, I think your technology makes manufacturing easier. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess the best way to compare it to it is teaching people originally when the internet appeared. And initially, yeah, it might not make sense. Like, what are you replacing exactly? Uh, an encyclopedia, uh, a letter <laughs> mail. But right. the reality is, is the moment the world moved into an in internet era, you have so many more capabilities that opened up and opportunities that just, oh, yeah. you couldn't envision it back in the 90s, no. like until it all appeared for us. And the way that the manufacturing sector is going is, it's the same thing. Manufacturers that are not yet digital, I, I think that there's this missing component of what exactly do we gain by going there? Yeah. And until you take a step and you start to realize that every single thing that takes place can be streamed immediately, it doesn't mean that you have to get stacks of paperwork to then figure out what this data means. It means that there are program engines that can process that for you and tell you instantly how to react. And it's, it's live sensory devices throughout your factory and catching problems instantly. And so that way, there's just so much. Much easier. Much easier. <laughs> yeah. I, I, this I, isn't I, harder, this is easier. Everything's easier. And okay. uh, yeah. Now you said something at the beginning, you went through it really fast, but it's, uh, paper versus uh, being digital. And you said that the being digital does three things that paper doesn't do. And, and you talk about it doesn't, you know, papers don't collect data. Yep. And uh, what well, else? So a couple of things I would say is one, um, there's a lot of people that speak a lot of languages. Yeah. So if you have your paper in English, it doesn't necessarily mean that the operators understand what you're asking them to do. Right. Uh, so it could have uh, disadvantages on that one. Also, not only do you have to pay for the paper, print the paper, the revision control concerns yeah. with it, we also have no way of knowing did the operators even look at or engage the piece of paper. Right. And then the third thing is, is that the paper doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't collect anything. It doesn't talk to anything. It doesn't, it literally does nothing. Well, uh, see, I love that part of it. That was the part I wanted to focus on. Just what you're well, using a, paper with does those things. Yeah. And then there's a saying where a picture is worth a thousand words. And I, I believe that was a, a video is worth 1.8 million words. And it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you need to have a video on everything, but within Scout, uh, we have a laser etcher that's a bit more complex to use. And we have work instructions that can guide people through start to finish. And one of the things that we like to do is when we bring in a new sales rep is to say, build this product with zero training. So that way, when they show up and they start scratching their head and be like, I don't even know what that machine is. It's like, here's your badge sign in and then just let them go. And uh, Tristan and I, we do a lot of these videos. Yeah. Tristan did this where he went through and built start to finish, built the product flawlessly. Oh, and wow. it was his very first time. And then when he gets out of it, you go, that is what you are selling. The fact that you could help guide somebody start to finish, wow. making sure they don't make any errors. <laughs> Nobody needed to train you how to do it. We just simply wow. gave you a badge and you signed in and started working. Okay, and now I know you've prepared a PowerPoint for us to look at, and I mean, there's there's so much you know other questions that I have, and I think this is so cool. But I think it'd be really cool to show them uh, this. Yeah. PowerPoint. let me let me get this loaded up for you. Uh, so, switch screens. So now, what, a common one that people have asked me about this was trying to make sense and like, how can you go from 
where you are to become a, a smart factory. And I like to call it smart factory instead of calling it like IOT or industry 4.0, because realistically, it's not the marketing terminology that I care about. It's more of what is your factory doing for you? Make it into a living organism that is a functioning tool in itself. And the way that we like to focus on this is to start from the ground up. Legacy platforms back in the day, uh, I mean, still modern uh, ERPs even, it's a 30,000 foot viewpoint where you have to put in a tremendous amount of upfront work and then it cascades downward into all the other areas. And if you don't set up your ERP or uh, a sophisticated MES platform, an MRP program, if you don't do it correctly, it can have consequences, which would then mean that the data that you use and capture just aren't as good. So what we always recommend is start at the baseline. And we have our system capable of working without instructions. So literally day one, the moment we turned it on, you could begin to use our system without any effort. You plug it in and it goes. Wow. And out the gate, you get a production level knowledge of the production time, the problems that you have, the cycle times, the setup times, all that content of where your jobs are, you know that immediately. And then as you begin to become, uh, we call it data mature, as your data maturity starts to increase, now you start to realize where your problems are, start to work on your standard operating procedures, your SOPs, implementing work instructions, connect them into your tooling, making sure that you have validation checks in place and automate your work instructions so your operators don't have to engage a screen. Once you're beyond that, then maybe we need to start controlling your tools, tie it into maintenance platforms and make sure that everything is being maintained properly this kind of platform can count every single time that you've cut something. So rather than changing blades every three months, maybe it's 10,000 cuts. And we could tell you that you're at 950 cuts right now, so you better start getting the blade ready. Yeah. Those kinds of things just really help make sure that your quality is maintained, your maintenance is exactly on point. Wow. And then you keep going further and further up. Get your management in there. Start to give them those dashboards where they get excited. And then integrate this thing in with other platforms so that way one platform is talking to another and your whole world is automated. So, so Ben, I've been very impressed with all of this, but now kind of what I'm hearing you say is that this integrates with the software they already have. It should. So as long as the software that they have has an API, but yeah. almost every modern software does, and the yeah. API is basically the mechanism with software to communicate. Yeah, exactly. You could take from ours, which is, um, just a gigantic net that captures very accurate production data. And then, then you can start to say like, well, our ERP wants to know when this job finishes, or we want to know when a maintenance request has been submitted. Those kind of elements, you just basically ask of Scout, this is the data that we want, and then we can push it out to you at the frequency wow. that you need. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So then a common question people have also asked is about like, well, what does the future look like? I have a very manual assembly line. There's no robots. How do we have a world engaged? So this is from one of our customers and I was able to borrow their picture here. And this is a cell that they were building within our system. And so to, to walk through like how a, a manual world can be implemented using those APIs we just talked about, you can pull your production schedule automatically from your ERP. So mm -hmm. you no longer have to have a piece of paper work traveler. You don't have to have your supervisors retyping out a redundant form of uh, content to post a job. This is your ERP can pull the schedule, load it up into your workstations. So that way you have an automated handoff. When your operators scan in, we can verify which operator it is. We can know where they are in the system. You can use that for cross training. We do all of our data analysis to analyze the product, the station, the tools, and the operators. So if you're looking to cross train and figure out where to better improve your operators, we know everything about them from what they've done within our system. The platform, it uses work instructions to guide the operators through step by step. And of course, it is capturing all that production data. But with our hardware, we can use our hardware, which we call tracker, to be then integrated in with your equipment. So if you have auto testers, leak testers, functional testers, if you have smart tools, if you have push pedals, whisker switches, as your product moves through, uh, all sorts of different ways you could start to integrate your tools with your work instructions to again, allow your work instruction to sit static on a screen, and then it will automatically move through the instructions without the need of your operator's engagement. Unlike paper work instructions, which is dangled in front of your operators, <laughs> you can create it in a way that will sequentially move the operators through. So if they forget a step and they look up at the screen, the screen will show them where they should have been, 
and they could realize right then and there that they missed something. And then uh, the tooling for validation, all those different elements, yeah. you can even put in go, no go gauges. You can request your operators to take measurements to validate that this part is correct. If you're trying to do SPC analysis, you can have it built into the work instructions so that way it captures the data so your quality team gets the data just fine. And your operators aren't having to do supplementary uh, paper trails. Um, and then these next two are really popular right now is as people are moving towards getting to a, a higher quality levels and reducing their PPM to their factory, a big question has been is serial tracing a product. Oh yeah. We could, we could track a customer number, a work order number, a specific unit, but if your product has a barcode on there with a serial identifier, you can scan that into our system and we will be able to tell you historically, if you ever have a defect claim, we can look up that specific serial number and pull up every single bit of production data. And we'll build it where and when. And if you had it embedded with test equipment or measurements, we can pull all that content. And then to make it one better is if you wanted to, you could put web cameras above your station. And if you have a critical step, our system can use a web camera to snap a picture, store it to that serial number. So if that customer claims that you forgot to gasket, you could pull up that serial number and you could have a picture of that product with the gasket in place. And then you can use that as a negotiating tactic to <laughs> subtract that defect claim against your record. Wow. That's so fantastic. all of this can be done with a, a manual assembly world. And again, there's no robots here. There's nothing too sophisticated. Even though this looks really fancy, we do this on cells that are, are built out of wood bench tops. It's, it's really easy. You get to choose where you want to get ingrained. And then- uh, <laughs> hey man, If I could yeah. go back two slides, I, I just have a quest, quick question for you. And this occurred to me on the, the slide before this one. Okay. You have the, oh, sorry. Yeah, I have to make you go back through, but- That's all good. Yeah, no, I, you know, I was imagining as, as people uh, start off with, with scout systems and they, they, they put this in place, it looks like every level of the company has some involvement with this. Uh, I was just wondering, you told the story about a, uh, I can't remember, it was down in Mexico, but I think they, they manufactured rail cars. Yeah. But um, what, what is happening? What do you notice with companies as they get the scout systems information at their fingertips? What's, what do you see? I'll, I'll tell you examples on, on the best practices. Um, the best practices is when management work hand in hand with the floor operators. Ah. Uh, it, when you get all of this data, the number one thing that you should not do is you should not use this data to criticize your employees okay. because <laughs> the moment you do that, they are going to start figuring out how to shut down data collection because this is no longer a beneficial tool. This is a scary tool. Yeah. But, right. <clears throat> in, in the example of uh, the rail car customer, the, the operators, they were complaining about how much time they had to sit around waiting for a forklift or a crane to move the product. Because the product they built was so massive, even the smallest product, a, a person couldn't pick it up. Everything had to be done by a forklift or a crane. Okay. So these operators were constantly complaining, we don't have enough forklifts, we don't have enough cranes. Management, they didn't want to fork out the tens of thousands of dollars to buy this. And instead they said, just keep doing what you're doing. So when as soon as we showed up and we put our platform in place, we talked to the operators and we get recommendations on what should be your, your pause codes. So you can customize a bunch of reasons for pause. And one of the ones that operators desperately wanted was waiting for a forklift or a crane. They wanted to be able to measure that. Mm. And within the very first month of using our system, management saw that they had an enormous amount of waste on their production floor of waiting for the forklift and crane and it justified the expense of buying them a new one. Um, okay. So just doing like that, it made the operators realize that by using this tool appropriately, my management can now fiscally measure what this is costing us and they can invest appropriately. So this is an empowering tool. It's an empowering process all the way around. It's not being used to, the transparency isn't being used to beat people up. It's being used to empower them. Exactly. And, and uh -huh. it's, it's great because like so many times, unfortunately, when I show up, uh, I always like to ask new customers, especially the operators, how much do you know about this product and do you know who I am? My favorite answer is when operators say, I have no idea who you are or why you're here. Then I have a clean slate to work from. And I explain, uh -huh. this is what this product is going to do for you. And I try to help work with the customer to build this up. 
when when customers have an idea about oh we're going to big brother this and the operators start to have their, yeah. their muttering and that's a little bit more difficult for me to repair but when i do subsequent follow visits it is so neat to walk through the production floor and to see so many operators wave to me out of excitement that i'm there because since the first day that i was there they have better tools they have better processes morale has gone up the factory yeah. is moving cleaner and it's just it's neat and at first there's skepticism, but then I'm a part of the team and it's, it's an honor for me. Leaps and bounds. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Thank you for letting me go back and just ask you that question. I, yeah, I was trying to imagine what would happen inside of, you know, the management and the operators and wow. Uh, so, so from that management perspective that the last slide I wanted to just show you real quick was uh, this one here. So HQ, so compass, the, the guiding light for the operators, and then HQ, the headquarters. So anybody that is going to be in the office, we also needed to make sure that the office people are equipped so that way they can also make positive movements to impact the capacity of the floor. So this is just a small screenshot of what we call live production. And this gives uh, production supervisors or whomever that has access to this ability, they can pre-populate the schedule if you don't have it sunk to your ERP or sync to your ERP, and then you can also expand the, the production schedule and change the priority. So if there's a hot job, uh, yeah. you can quickly shift that around and it seamlessly updates the system so your operators, they don't have to be interrupted. They focus on building a product. Oh. Uh, this is a brand new feature that's actually getting rolled out today. So oh, wow. uh, <laughs> nice. but yeah, you're, you're getting a sneak peek to this one. Yeah. So a lot of our customers are gonna be excited when they, when they turn on the program today is that we're rolling out two different dashboards this one is an executive level dashboard, which is doing that live time OEE, measuring all of your production information, comparing it against your historical trends to show you at a quick glance, how effective is your plant? So all of that data that we collect, we statistically measure it, clean it up, and then we present it in a way that your management team can make effective decisions that are educated and they require no upfront work for them. It's all wow. naturally streaming in. Wow. Another one that's big for me is, uh, We've been talked to a lot of customers about this. And um, even though I like a lot of traditional things, I try to put a more modern spin on it. And Andon platforms are wildly beneficial, but traditionally they're very expensive, big light towers, only visible if you're there. So we wanted to build a digital Andon platform. And so similar to an Andon, if you have a maintenance issue, it shows as red. If it's a material, it shows as blue. And if it's any other custom issues, it will show as orange. And so that way you could have an active response team that can see this from their cell phone or from the desktop. Or if you want to have big projectors out there, you yeah. can have a really clean and on viewpoint. Nice. Documentation tools are built into our platform where you can have the approval uh, processes in place. All your revision control is done. And another feature that we just rolled out is that every time that you do a new publishing, we do archive a new version and we store that historically. So you can always go back and look at your old logs and tons and tons and tons of production reports to analyze every single bit of your production process. And then when you're ready for it, the API portal, this is how you could start to connect our platform to other systems. And you could really start to then unlock the abilities that the digital factory will provide. Oh man. I, you know, I think this is very exciting for anybody who's tried to use traditional ERPs or, you know, other systems, I, you know, this, this to me really puts a layer of usability, you yep. know, we didn't have before. And just to make sure it's clear too. So this doesn't compete with an ERP. Uh, this is a bolt on application. Our goal is to just collect the best data while solving problems for you. Some of our customers will have an ERP, an MRP, and another MES system, but our system, because of its ease of use and it's, it's inexpensive, it collects such good data you could feed into others. Some companies are using us as their MES platform just to run the whole entire manufacturing suite, but it goes hand in hand with ERP platforms. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, my goodness, thank you for, for sharing that. And I think the level of transparency uh, but also how easy you've made this, but how nice, I mean, the visuals are nice. And uh, I don't know, is there something to be afraid of here, Ben, from your point of view, is there something <laughs> manufacturers should worry about? Oh man, um, I, if I was to put any negative spin on anything, because if we're gonna be a realist about this, 
the same way when you talk about uh, the efficiency gains. Like the day we start to move towards AI, uh, the way that robots can displace some workers on the factory floor, I do expect there will be a displacement of office workers at some point in the future. Yeah, uh, it, it's not to eliminate all, but when you have the ability to automate a lot of this, there's going to be a large expense that people are going to notice that they do. Um, but I don't think that's something you should be worried about because in, in the capitalist society that we live in, and especially in the globalized world, manufacturers all around the world are striving to figure out how do we build a product the fastest without any defects and without the most expensive. Yeah. So it's what we have to do. And this is a, a wonderful stepping stone to put us in a position where we can continue to be competitive. And at some point in the future, there's gonna be jobs that are not gonna be needed. Uh, the same way the travel agencies aren't really needed anymore. Like those things are gonna naturally start to fade away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a world where workers and employees are gonna to have to learn these skills. We're gonna to have to scale up towards us. So. Hey, do you mind unsharing your screen and I'll, I'll look at you again. There you go. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Yeah. So uh, to me, this has been a great, uh, I don't know, journey through, through a Scout Systems world and what you're doing. It's so innovative. And uh, again, I think designed to make businesses better. Now, you've mentioned that you have international as well as U.S.-based clients. But what's your observation in terms of adaption and what, what's going on? So we originally were focused heavily on the U.S. market because we are a U.S.-based company. And uh, we're to a point now where about 50% of our business is now international. We get a lot more interest. Um, the ones that I'm most impressed by, too, is Latin America is stepping wow. up their game significantly. Wow. Where when, when I travel, well, pre-COVID, when I travel to facilities in the U.S., I, I noticed that the U.S. had a little bit more hesitancy to data systems. When I show up in a place in, in Mexico, I swear there's a red carpet for me. Uh, the factories <laughs> down there recognize the power of data and they are eager to adopt. Yeah. Uh, we have our, our international customers that are located in the European nations or European countries, they are heavily focused on IoT movements. And when, when I talked a lot to these, the US-based manufacturers, it's a, a mistake. To look at the company that's down the street as your competitor. You, you yeah. can't do that. There are mega factories that are appearing around the world and they are extremely efficient. And as their reputation grows and their, their global spread continues to expand, mm -hmm. uh, tariffs are going to make it very, uh, it's going to be a small hurdle for them to overcome because mm -hmm. of what they're able to do differently. So I, I really encourage that US based manufacturers to take this opportunity. Uh, this COVID is making everybody go digital. This is a really yeah. good opportunity to start exploring this research because you could do a lot from, from a distance. And yeah. it, it's something that's coming and, and you, I don't think you can stop it. So, so Ben, I, I think about this in terms of unlocking the, the hidden value within your current process. I mean, we weren't talking about heavy investments in equipment. We were talking about heavy investments in robotics. We were actually talking about taking what you're doing and unleashing the value that's there. And I believe that the value you've seen for your clients is showing up on the bottom line. Oh, instantly. Um, like, I kid you not, the ROI on our system, what you pay us, your ROI is about five minutes. And that's, it's not an exaggeration. It's really, really easy to do. Our system oh, is geez. incredibly inexpensive. And uh, uh, I've had people ask us, well, your model is, is flawed. How is it so inexpensive? And the reality is, is that we plan to expand like a virus in your organization. We want to be yeah. everywhere. Um, so oh, yeah. Yeah. you're not going to put our system just on your bottleneck. That's not going to solve you anything. And it's not going to generate revenue for us. You're going to test it. You're going to love it. And it's going to start to expand throughout. And then you're going to have that full transparency. You're going to be happy as a manufacturer. We're going to be happy because we're going to have a sizable client. And you're never going to get rid of us. This is a long-term relationship because yeah, as we continue to build product for you, you're going to be thrilled. So when companies start to use our system, the benefits are the quality improvements, training time reduction, uh, increases in capacity significantly, uh, better uh, preventative maintenance plans, better scheduling, uh, better billing, all of those things get more accurate. And then you find yeah. out that there's so many opportunities. You <laughs> fix one thing, uh, our system costs like a, about a dollar a day uh, around that. And so it's not very expensive. No, it's really not. If you have computers in place, then you're, you're set. If you don't have computers in place, you'll have a small upfront. But other than that, 
and that's going to also be recouped in a couple of like probably two to three months. Do you know uh, what was interesting to me is when I came in towards your your office and you and I and Mark spoke because I think yeah. Mark's a little bit more on the software development side. Sorry for right. the background noise that's here. Okay. But uh, Mark said there's so much uh, happening uh, for development ideas. So what's nice about your system and your process is you update here locally and then it goes throughout the world. I mean, yes. And yeah. I th it sounds like there's a whole list of, you know, future developments on the way. It, yeah, it's, it's our favorite thing. So uh, just yesterday, Mark and I were uh, on the dry erase boards uh, designing out the next coming system that we're building out. And a sneak peek to that is we're trying to put in place a routing platform that will allow customers to optimize the flow of material. So when they put it in an order, our system will begin to analyze all the stations to help companies start to figure out how to dynamically adjust the smartest route through their factory. And wow. so it'll, it's gonna be a while for us to finish yeah. this, but we are always developing and we exclusively serve the manufacturing sector. And as we sign on new clients, uh, we have uh, two or three new clients right now that we have a contract in place where they wanted to see a couple features. So we agreed, we will develop those features at no cost. When we finish them, every customer will get those features and it just, that's amazing. We, okay. we constantly yeah. listen to manufacturers and find out what is a problem that you need to have solved. And if it's something we think we could solve, we put it in. So there's scout systems today and then there's scout systems tomorrow. And I think the people who jump on board with you can be confident that, you know, their capabilities are going to expand and increase. And I think about Amazon starting off in Jeff Bezos garage and becoming, yeah. you know, it owns the world today. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I just think that, what you've done innovatively now. Uh, so you've been at this for how long now? Is it three, three or five oh, years? I think we're coming up on the end of our fifth year now. So wow, yeah, year. we spent the first like two years uh, kind of covertly just developing. Yeah. And then, uh, then we hit the commercial market and we've been growing since. Well, I'll tell you, there's just a level of complexity that you've put into this that makes it simple for the end user. Yep. It makes your life easier. So I highly recommend that you know, if you've been listening to this and you've, if you've enjoyed the conversation, I, I learned something new from Ben every time I talk to him. And uh, I get more and more insight into the manufacturing world and processes and improvements uh, just talking to you. Uh, but if somebody wants to get a hold of you, are you hard to get a hold of? What, no, uh, not at all. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're still a small business, so we have that mentality. Uh, I, I'll give my cell phone to customers and I'll let them know if you ever have a problem at midnight, call me. I'll make sure somebody <laughs> takes care of it. So you, you get that customer support yeah. with us. But um, I was the original, Mark and I were the founders. So our emails are the easiest. So mine's ben at scout.systems, no.com, just scout.systems. But um, I'm, I'm actively on LinkedIn. So if people want to yeah. talk to me about that, uh, as I've told you earlier, I'm, I'm an engineer first, a sales rep second. So I don't, I'm not really good at that, that pushy stuff, yeah. but I, I love to hear about problems and I get really invested in how we can solve them. And so if, yeah. yeah, if somebody's interested, email me directly, Ben at Scout Systems, find me on LinkedIn, Ben Marsh, yeah. or visit us, scout.systems and submit a inquiry and we'll, we'll chat. Yeah, Ben is one of the nicest people. He, uh, he'll take time for you. Uh, I've been so impressed with, with him and his entire team. So interacting with them, they've just been great. So I highly recommend them. Uh, ben, thank you so much for this time. And they're gonna see you at our panel that we're gonna do, we're gonna record that as well. But uh, there's gonna be an opportunity for you to ask Ben more questions in person here, or at yeah. least virtually. So yeah, Ben. Well, I'll, just, I'll plug one thing too is, yeah. uh, so this year's assembly show is all virtual. So I'm gonna be doing some panel events on that. Oh, yeah. And so I'm gonna be having two panel events that I'm gonna be publishing. So if people do not attend the events, I will be publishing them on LinkedIn, but it's gonna be IIoT in the assembly world as one event. And then the other one is how to maintain morale in a digital culture. So I'll be posting both of those videos for people that are interested in that. And I'll be sharing a lot of case stories and best practices. Now, uh, also some of this will be on your website, right? Coming up, yeah. so scout.systems. And um, ben, ben, I just wanna thank you for actually, I think, you know, I don't think we say it enough, but you know, CAMPS is a community of manufacturers and we're all working together as a community to improve and get better. And I just think that you're uh, such a great example of the innovation problem solving that I see with all the manufacturers, but your investments early, you know, years ago uh, are, are bearing grapefruit. And I highly recommend uh, again, that, that you get to know CAMPS because we're a community working together, but Ben, you're such a, an important part of our CAMPS community and I appreciate that.
I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with manufacturers. It is my favorite subject in the world. <laughs> so I, I can nerd out with somebody. So <laughs> caution to whoever wants to talk to me. Just don't ask me too much about data because you'll need to block uh, out a lot of time. I think it's great. Hey, well, you're certainly a pioneer and we sure appreciate everything you do. Hey, thanks well, a lot. Thank